that's the ground truth and we are currently evolving more and more algorithms with which we will make more sense of this energy data Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from Internet of Things thought leaders who are transforming businesses today. With your host, Eric Walenza. Let's move on now to a look at a specific case. I know we want to anonymize the, the end customers here, but let's choose specifically one, uh, one project that you've uh, worked on over the past year and dig a bit more into what was the problem, uh, which type of, uh, of customer was this, and then what, what solution was deployed? And also, I mean, certainly a look um, at the, the challenges during deployment, I think, would be very insightful. In yeah. keeping with uh, an anonymization, please uh, maybe frame the, um, the case for us so that we, we have an idea of well, which type of customer we're working with here. And then what was the situation that was being addressed? So let me uh, spend a couple of minutes explaining about the whole uh, idea of uh, energy analytics and what we are trying to achieve. So if you see, conventionally, energy uh, is being considered as a commodity in a manufacturing uh, enterprise where uh, at the end of the month you get a bill for the amount of energy that you consumed and you need to clear it, right? So it has been always considered as a commodity uh, which is uh, having an incidental expense, right? But if you look very deep, uh, this is a very, very close... Uh, watch on uh, the way power is consumed or electricity is consumed, which reveals a lot more than just your consumption. Uh, it can it can tell you a lot more of uh, deeper insights about how the plant is operated, what kind of uh, uh, inefficiencies are uh, uh, prevalent, and uh, what other additional advantages can be taken based on the power profiles or uh, patterns. So this is precisely the scope of our work. And that's how we try to transform energy from being an incidental commodity uh, costing expense to uh, make it a strategic resource where uh, it can have a significant influence on planning and also take it uh, towards operational excellence. So that's the philosophy with which we are working. So the case uh, which I would like to uh, explain is uh, one of the uh, alloy uh, wheel manufacturers where uh, they have multiple casting machines, right? So they basically make the aluminum wheels, uh, the uh, aluminum, raw aluminum uh, in terms of robots come to the plant. They have a melting area where the uh, aluminum is uh, melted and the molten aluminum is uh, sent into uh, casting. Uh, they, they're uh, made into the wheel shape and then later it is sent for heat treatment and machining and finally painted. So this is the entire process flow. Uh, it's, a, it's a aluminum manufacturing company, uh, aluminum wheel manufacturing company. So what we have done here is uh, we have implemented the uh, energy meters at uh, the machine level. So we have uh, in the casting area, we have about 32 casting machines. And all the testing machines individually have been metered, and we try to collect data from individual machines at multiple data points like voltage, current, power factor, power, power uh, uh, fluctuations, harmonics, and so on. So all these parameters are collected at uh, various intervals. So the idea was to understand for a given variant each machine how much it is consuming to produce that particular variant. And so we have production data which tells us how much is the energy consumption for uh, every ship when number of points uh, like uh, X quantity of variant 1 or Y quantity of variant 2 has been produced. So we try to get all this data to analyze the specific energy consumption of every piece uh, for the given variant and the quantity. So this is the first exercise that we do, trying to understand how much energy has been consumed to produce one piece of a given variant or given model number. Right? So with this information, when we look at multiple machines, there are 32 machines, so all the 32 machines, are they consuming the same amount of energy to produce one unit piece of the given variant? 
That's basically to say whether the specific MRP can function are consistent across multiple machines. So with this exercise, you need to be able to analyze whether there is any kind of deviation in terms of specific energy consumptions between multiple machines. And secondly, if there is a reason for the deviation, we want to understand whether it is a machine-specific reason or whether it is a variant-specific reason. What I mean by machine-specific reason is was there no maintenance done on that particular machine or was there any other reason because of which one machine is consuming more energy for the same piece when compared to another another machine. For other reasons, just in case this deviation cannot be set right, then we try to also map to produce the given variant which is the most ideal machine for uh, what volume. Say, for example, if there are 100 pieces to be produced of variant A, then which is the ideal machine to produce these 100 pieces amongst a bunch of machines? So these kinds of specific energy consumption-related analytics helps in analyzing which model is best suited to be produced in which machine, which is currently not directly transparently available for the production planning use cases. So we try to go back from the energy consumption patterns, we try to identify those matching profiles between a given variant and the machine that can try to interface with the production planning itself so that we will be able to incorporate these finer optimization opportunities in the planning stage. So this is one of the use cases which I thought would be very interesting uh, to see how energy can be more influencing the planning stage. Very interesting uh, description of the use case. You know, it was uh, different than I was expecting. I was expecting you to say that you would try to uh, work through the data to identify the cause of the variation or the deviation between energy consumption per machine and identify root causes and resolve yeah. that. But instead, you're saying that you're optimizing around that as a given condition of particular machines and then uh, managing uh, production flow to direct right. Uh, units. Why? Why that? Rather, is it is okay. it that you're you're unable or or it's not feasible to identify the root cause of, of deviation and then to uh, address those deviations? It's a very interesting question. See, uh, as you rightly said, for uh, the given analysis that one machine is consuming more energy when compared to the other machine, uh, if this is the given scenario, there are two approaches that you can do. One is to see whether it requires a lot more of deep dive analysis to understand why the machine which is consuming more energy can be brought down to the level of the other machine. That's one direction of approach. And the second is to understand what can I do with this given status to optimize my throughput. So if both these, both these uh, directions have a cost function and a benefit, right? The first one has a lot of cost involved in identifying the root cost, which has a lot more of uh, influencing parameters than what you would have ideally observed. So there's a lot of uh, in-field investigation which requires tremendous amount of time, effort, and cost. On the other side, for the given business problem, if it is more suitable to go with just the mapping between the given piece and which machine is the most preferred for producing this piece, then that particular thing would be more. So it's extremely case-by-case case specific. So in this particular uh, example that I have taken, what we did was this company manufactures multiple variants. They manufacture close to about 200 variants, right? So for every variant, we try to build a table in the order of priority, which is the most suitable machine for producing that particular variant based on all the backlog of data that we have analyzed. So all the 215 variants have individual bunch of tables uh, sorted based on the order of preference, which machine is the best suited for performing a production of that particular variant. So likewise, we have built a two-dimensional uh, matrix with which when the production plan is generated, we try to say, these are all the best preferred machines to perform 
the required uh, production plan volume and by doing this combination the total energy consumption for doing the production overall would be the least interesting i can see why this approach makes sense in a, it, absolutely in a situation where taking the additional step of of identifying the root cause of a of a deviation would require significantly more resources you now have a relatively quick win where you already have the data available uh, you can make the modifications and um, and then you can you can see a result what results are you seeing in this particular case uh, what are we talking about in terms of percentile of energy reduced or or uh, other okay. uh, factors uh, that you're measuring okay i will give you some statistics on just the casting machine uh, when it was trying to produce the best casting machine when it was trying to produce the given variant for one piece the energy consumption was uh, 1.3 kilowatt hour per piece which is 1.3 units of electricity uh, per piece but when the bad machine the bad machine it was about 2.4 so that's almost two two times machine in terms of its consumption so on the other side we also did another very interesting analysis that is to understand the best machine how it is performing across multiple days so that's what we call as peer group comparison where we try to compare for similar boundary conditions two machines or a bunch of machines to understand who is the best performer and who is the worst performer but then what we also did interestingly was to try and analyze more in detail the best performers multiple performances over a period of time that's what we call as best history comparison when we compared the best performing machines multiple days performance for the similar boundary conditions like same production quantity same variant same machine similar component and so on what happened was we found that over a period of time there is one recording where the best performer has demonstrated best performance and this one was as low as 1.018 kilowatt hour per piece what we finally found is that uh, the best performing machines best performance is far lower than what what value i mentioned earlier that's 1.3 so that's already 30% lower than uh, what i earlier mentioned as the best performing machines uh, performance so therefore we try to analyze now what are all the influencing factors which is contributing to this variation amongst the best performing machines performances and thereby trying to classify them as controllable parameters and uncontrollable parameters and later we then try to replicate the good performance by getting the same set points for the influencing parameters which are controllable okay understood so you have a difference Hello? between the best performing machines and the worst performing but also between the uh, best performance and the worst performance of each particular machine and then uh, an understanding of of why a machine performed well on one day and not another and uh, are yeah. are the parameters uh, controllable exactly so in thereby terms. we try to replicate more the best performance of the best best performing machine what were the results of your analysis what were you able to to uh, find out for this particular case there are a few which we have found out like for example the maintenance part of uh, the machine for example when we also use the same data point that is kwh per, per piece for a given machine as its baseline and when we see that this is drifting beyond a given value then we can do a maintenance based on this drift that is the performance indicator right so in in the best performing case uh, what we have found that the uh, maintenance was just done and the next very next day we have had a very good performance which was then slowly starting to degrade over a period of time so thereby we try to give more emphasis on these interventions which are uh, like um, the the uh, maintenance activities what we found is the best performance of the best performing machine was preceded by a particular maintenance activity so do we try to then increase the frequency of this maintenance activity to ensure that the same kind of performance is replicable across multiple cycles 
Understood. So I suppose you have a given cost for each maintenance activity and you, you can see what the, um, the energy savings is uh, based on this and then decide based on this the, the frequency of the activity for a given machine. What are we talking about in, in terms of impact? Were you able to quantify the, the energy savings or the end uh, cost savings? We have uh, been able to achieve uh, somewhere between uh, 5 to uh, 8 percentage of uh, energy savings within the first six months of our entry into this particular uh, project. And uh, we are hopeful that we will be able to uh, continuously improve as and when we find more and more such opportunities to uh, intervene. And then in terms of uh, rerouting production flow, is this something that... Um most or or many companies are are currently able to do, or is this somewhat of a unique situation for this particular uh, manufacturer based on the number of uh, of SKUs and the and the and the setup? Is this uh, I suppose is this uh, you believe a, a replicable so this is something situation? Uh, we are doing a customized uh, uh, solution which we are able to offer primarily because, uh, uh, as you rightly said, uh, uh, the choice of the machine. Uh, would not be so uh, flexible in any other environment or not in any other uh, similar site because there would be other operating constraints. So the, the idea was to first unearth the philosophy of human uh, inefficiencies can be identified with very deep uh, data-based approach rather than uh, do uh, peripheral interventions like, uh, uh, let's say, solar or uh, uh, moving from uh, CFL to LED or uh, doing some kind of uh, VFT intervention and so on. So those are all the peripheral interventions. But what we are able to now perform is very core um, identification of uh, inefficiencies in their manufacturing processes because of the advent of this kind of uh, data points. Talk to me a bit about the analysis. There's been a, a lot of uh, p- potentially excessive hype around AI or, or machine learning and uh, applications to analytics. To what extent is this still uh, this analysis being done relatively manually, meaning that you and your team are, are uh, individually pouring through the data uh, to identify causality and so forth, uh, as opposed to having a, an, an engine that's running uh, machine analytics um, or, or machine learning analytics and is uh, presenting potential hypotheses? Uh, to you for for consideration. As I uh, keep telling that uh, every uh, problem that we speak today is uh, having its own flavor of uh, customization, wherein uh, the the applicability of uh, an algorithm from one world is not directly fit and forget, right? And that's where the base enablers, even if you talk about uh, uh, let's say, some kind of machine learning related uh, algorithms. There are fundamentals in the uh, machine learning world, which is like feature extraction. Uh, those are all the things which are currently automated. So we have automated algorithms which are running for extracting the features from the given set of data points, right? And from the features, to construct a machine learning algorithm or to construct a, a classification kind of algorithm, we really have to have uh, our engineers, our data scientists who are working full time on it. And we are hopeful that as and when we have more and more such kind of uh, similar case studies, we can package them into standard offerings, which can then become a part of our online analytical platform. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, this is very much a, a work in progress, right? You really have to um, work your way through the data and, and address these um these cases on a one-off basis, and then as you right. as you go through right. this process, so, you'll you'll be able to standardize. I, um, I would like to add one more uh, interesting case study, just just to give you a background of uh, the question that you asked. I mean, if you look at machine maintenance today in the typical manufacturing world, it's period based. That means once in fifteen days, or once in one month, or once in two months, there is a, a routine maintenance which is happening, right? Now, this maintenance is not yet converted into usage-based maintenance. What I mean by usage-based maintenance is, let's say, for example, in an automobile, when we go for servicing, it's both period-based, which is time-based, as well as usage-based. 
For example, the service technician would say, you need to bring your car uh, once in one year or once in 5,000 kilometers. So there's a second dimension with which the maintenance is triggered. But in a, in a typical manufacturing site, uh, not in every machine, we are capturing the number of hours for which it is operating, right? So now with the electrical data points, we will be able to tell when the machine started, how long did it operate, and when did it end. So with all this information, we can now start triggering usage-based maintenance instead of relying on time-based maintenance. So that means what you are supposed to do in one month could be either advanced to 25 days or it can be deferred to 45 days based on the usage of the machine. So this is the next paradigm shift from time-based to usage-based. Now in usage-based also, you can again classify within the last 300 hours of operation, how many hours was in high stress zone, that means overloading operation, and how much was in normal operating conditions. So if you set a band that every 300 hours I have to do maintenance, that might again have to be slightly moved around if the machine is seeing more amount of operation in stress zone, and less amount of operation in normal zone when compared to another scenario where the machine is always operating in normal zone. So we move from time-based maintenance to usage-based maintenance, and then again from usage-based maintenance, we move to stress-based maintenance. I see. And the stress-based maintenance, though, is, is based on time in a particular operating zone. It sounds, though, like you would also have the possibility of having it based on, you know, let's say that a machine uh, generally t- uh, fluctuates between 1.2 and and 1.8 units of energy per per output. So when when the um, over maybe a three day period, the machine begins operating at 1.5 or higher, we set a threshold and say now it's time for a maintenance event. So based on uh, the the units of energy per unit produced, is this also something that uh, you're looking at implementing, or are there reasons that this is not uh, feasible or or, uh, or reasonable? Now that is actually what you say is based on the. Uh, specific energy consumption, that could also be a point for uh, triggering maintenance. But when I say stress, it's more about if there is a 100 kilowatt motor or 100 HP motor, how many minutes that did it run at 30 kilowatts? How many minutes did it run at 80 kilowatts? How many minutes did it run at 100 kilowatts? So if you have 100 minutes of operation, the maintenance will be very different. If the 100 minutes of operation was always at 30 kilowatts, Again, out of this 100 minutes, if the machine had operated at 80 kilowatt for more than 90% of the time, then the stress patterns on the machine will be very different. And hence, the maintenance has to be again adjusted based on that. So we are basically trying to uncover a lot of these hidden myths that maintenance has to be done periodically. And uh, even in maintenance, there is a lot of routine checks which happen. Uh, now imagine a scenario where... Uh, after 300 hours of operation, you know out of your 10 maintenance jobs, you need to do only two, and you don't need to do the rest of the eight. Then you are reducing the downtime of the machine, you are reducing the job on the machine, that is the man hours which is spent on maintenance. So there's a huge amount of potential in terms of reducing cost, time, and effort by improving the maintenance aspects of the machine by collecting a lot of fundamental data. This system, your ability to hand this off to the customer and, and step away from the system, is it? Uh, what, what is your feeling at this point? Is it um, stable to the point where you're able to um, Bosch is able to walk away from the customer, um, or is it a, a an environment where there's going to be um, still periodic uh, checks and a, a particular you know, a certain need for reassessment, a manual to an extent, reassessment of the data as opposed to a, uh, a platform that's able to, based on the, the insight that you've generated, make adjustments over time as the operating environment uh, changes in the, in the coming months and years? So our fundamental uh, business model is to uh, definitely have uh, uh, the system deployed in the customer space and then give them enough autonomy to access the data and uh, reduce its uh, manual activities in terms of reporting, data collection, making sense out of the data, and so on. That's to a level. But there are also higher levels of uh, data visualization, interpretation, and insight generation, which is not typically something that the customer 
can afford to do, given the resource constraints that is in, given the competence that is in, or it could even be that uh, there is a lot more of effort in terms of uh, trying to make that particular sense. So there is going to be a need for continuous engagement, and that's where it becomes extremely valuable because on one side you are automating a lot of uh, low-end, easily doable, uh, highly uh, uh, routine jobs, and thereby you are creating a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for uh, the customers to be available for uh, high-value generation related uh, discussions, clarifications, and working together. Talk to me a bit more about the business model here. Is this billed as a project? Is there any element that's success-based? So if, we, if you save uh, X percentage of energy, then there's a success-based uh, bonus to an extent. Or is this more of a subscription-type uh, service where they would bill based on a, a particular usage or, or time period? Okay, we have a variety of business models which we are trying to work with. Uh, some of them are uh, straight away uh, at the same uh, we do not commit anything on the outcome. We just uh, keep it neutral as a, a data acquisition and reporting dashboarding kind of exercise. On the other side, we also have uh, an integrated offering, which is data acquisition, some kind of advanced visualization on the portal, along with uh, analytics. So we do a plethora of activities, uh, and uh, we have a variety of models to engage with customers. Very good. I think uh, for me, very, very informative. Thanks for taking the time to uh, walk through the, the use case and then also give us a bit more insight into these two uh, specific uh, case studies. Wrapping up, anything else can, can, that can you think could, w- would be important to kind of to note to close out the discussion? Um, or, or are there any, um, any new solutions on the horizon that we should be looking out for? Basically, uh, I just wanted to uh, emphasize on this fact that uh, when we collect Anything related to uh, energy in a given uh, production environment, we have a lot of uh, opportunities to make sense out of this data because that's the ground truth. And we are currently evolving more and more algorithms with which we will make more sense of this energy data beyond energy consumption reduction and energy cost savings, which will in turn be extremely beneficial for achieving operating excellence in the manufacturing world. Yeah, I love this concept. So we're turning energy from a cost center into uh, an asset that provides insight into operations. Great work. Uh, I really look forward to uh, seeing where this goes in the coming years. I'm sure that I mean, we're, we're, we're at the first steps here. Uh, so you're at the forefront of a very interesting uh, area of development. Looking forward to, uh, we should schedule a call in a year and then see, uh, see where the technology has taken us. Sure, sure. We'll be very happy to share whatever we have achieved by then. Thanks so much for for sharing, and I look forward to staying in touch. Sure, and uh, looking forward for the pleasure of our further interactions as well. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoTONEHQ, and check out our database of case studies at IoTONE.com. If you have an interesting project, we would love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iotone.com.